would only be approved when certain public facilities would be available to meet the impacts of the development. This is concurrency. This is the time and the place that concurrency was born. The state's primary interests at the time were making sure that it encouraged development patterns in a more compact urban form of development and that it provided for affordable housing and adequate public facilities. Mind you, this is early to mid-1980s. 1987, the, plan, the Comprehensive Plan Committee issued a final report and it estimated that the state would need $53 billion to meet the infrastructure needs of all the new growth anticipated in our comprehensive plan. And then that, that did not include the tens of billions of dollars that the state was already in the hole for allowing growth to occur without an adequate funding source to provide for um, necessary infrastructure. The state's concurrency requirement for local governments was essential in this planning and shifted the historic burden from growth being paid by taxpayers onto growth itself. By 1989, however, the Sarasota County had abandoned this concept of concentric rings in favor of something called an urban service area growth boundary. Um, this is basically was described as I-75. So the concept as opposed to concentrating urban development and suburban development into these tight urban cores with transit and a very effective form of utilities uh, provisions that it would sprawl down the entirety of the coast, but it still maintained this concept that the eastern portions of Sarasota County would remain as rural lands, agricultural lands, and places for, um, for flood protection. Um, also, um, in, in, in 1985, this was the first time that Sarasota County included a map of its environmentally sensitive lands. I chose to bring this map to, tonight because it's, I believe, the only map surviving of its kind. Because when the consultant mapped the environmental lands for the county, it also included county-owned property. But the county had never intended to map its own lands, but only to map the lands of private landowners. And sure enough, one of the major county facilities under discussion at that time was the central Sarasota County landfill, um, then known as the Walton Track, now known as the Dome. Um, and the consultant um, suggested and adequately documented that the place where the county wanted to um, put its dump was in fact an environmentally sensitive piece of land. Um, as you might imagine, that map didn't last very long. Um, I grabbed a copy of it and, and held on to it. Um, the subsequent maps failed to show um, any of the environmentally sensitive lands on those, county par on those county parcels. In the late 1990s, adequate school facilities became a compelling issue and several amendments to the growth management legislation addressing the issue um, occurred, such as it is requiring school sites to be located on the comprehensive plan uh, maps, and also the voluntary adoption of something known as school concurrency. It was hoped that with this voluntary coordination of schools that we would not be required later on to mandate school concurrency. Um, and frankly, even uh, the hope was at the time that we would abolish the entire DRI process. Um, as we know, those hopes were not realized. In, 19, in the year 2005, the state mandated school concurrency um, as well as water concurrency at the time. In July of 2002, Sarasota County adopted 2050, the Resource Management Area Overlay District, with the promise, among other things, of improved environmental standards, walkable compact developments, internal commercial, affordable housing, and fiscal neutralities. About 18 months after the ink was dry on the 2050 plan, developers began to decry the plan as being unworkable, and the erosions and modifications of the plan soon pursue. In 2007 and 2008, Sarasota County voters approved amendments to the local charter requiring a majority vote plus one of the county commission to increase intensities or densities in the comprehensive plan and 
that any new urban service areas, those that were on the other side of, of that, that boundary there, that were designated must be fiscally neutral, neutral and require a unanimous vote of the county commission. There was one notable exception to that latter charter amendment, and that was those lands that were identified in the 2050 plan, which was a large portion of the eastern hinterlands that were outside of the urban service area would not be subject to this regulation. Um, there was talk at the time that since 2050 was unworkable, it was not financially plausible for the developers to, uh, to implement, that we just simply remove the plan and start anew and create a new plan for Eastern I-75 that would um, potentially protect the natural resources and accommodate new development. However, because the exception in the charter language um, existed, there were those that did not want to do away with the 2050 plan because it acted in essence of somewhat of a Trojan horse, allowing development east of I-75 that would be exempt from those county charters. In 2009, the counter-revolution began. This is the time to hold on to your horses. Uh, the legislature adopted significant changes to the growth management laws. Uh, then Governor Charlie Crist um, signed legislation that marked an omen for greater change um, in, in the two years to come. Build as an economic development tool, removing unnecessary restrictions in urban areas, and amendments were passed while, government, while Governor Charlie Crist fought a hard campaign for the U.S. Senate seat. Political discourse had become increasingly partisan and a single party dominated state legislature and ex executive branches persisted. The legislation created exemptions from transportation concurrency and from DRI review in areas called doulas, which were dense urban land areas, which was a vast um, extent of the state, and resulted in the functional death of concurrency. The legislative breakthrough against the established growth management system that had propelled Florida um, for, through, um, through many times. In 2011, the state legislature substantially re rewrote the State Planning Act and reorganized and reduced the staff and the functions of the Department of Community Affairs. The legislative action followed the election of Governor Rick Scott in the year 2010. Governor Scott, during his campaign, blamed the state's economic woes on excessive regulations and actively supported the elimination of the Department of the Community Affairs, which he labeled as the job killer. It was a perfect storm for the, uh, for the new administration. It was a one-party legislation. It contained economic woes and the built-up friction over the war on growth management from the preceding uh, decades um, combined and precipitated the adoption of something called the Community Planning Act of 2011. The Act supporters supported the change in the planning community as a way to let cities be cities and development as a way of creating jobs. The Department of Community Affairs was tarred as the boogeyman as a way to persuade legislatures to loosen or in some cases abolish rules that drove up the cost of development. Uh, the legislature reduced regional planning councils, and then few, a few weeks later, uh, the governor vetoed their, their funding. Local plans no longer had to be consistent with the state plans, and the state review process was substantially diminished. So that most plan amendments were reviewed in, were reviewed in an expedited process that did not include a compliance determination. Third-party challenges were difficult as the standing was changed. Transportation, schools, park, and recreational concurrencies were all made voluntary, and local government's decisions to eliminate concurrency was no longer subject to state reviews. The plans were no longer required to be financially feasible, nor based in anticipated need for development. The plans simply had to prove that they had the minimum amount of land necessary to accommodate the state's population projection. The act made it more inviting to do large-scale sector plans as opposed to DRIs uh, that were intended to limit um, anti-sprawl. Um, 
And once the sector plan was approved as a comprehensive plan amendment, the Metropolitan Planning Organization's Long Range Transportation Plan had to be amended to be consistent with the sector plan and regional water supply plans needed to incorporate the needs of those new growth that was approved. So in essence, what you saw was a complete flip-flop in what was driving the planning process. At one time, you had to prove that you had adequate water in schools and all these facilities. Now governments were able to approve development and those agencies that provided for water, that provided for all the floodplain protection, they had to prove that their plans were consistent to meet the demands of, of, of the new development that, that was approved. Um, at the time, um, I, I started taking, even before that, I started taking a serious look at just what is the capacity of our comprehensive plan. Um, my first analysis I did in 1995, um, and at the time that the population of, of Sarasota was around 200 and some odd thousand, um, the density, or the, um, if we were to take the comprehensive plans of Sarasota County and actually build them out like the plans say, at the time the population would have been uh, around 514,000. I did this same analysis some years later in 1998, I guess almost 10 years later, and I took all the comprehensive plans um, in the county of Sarasota, Longbow Key, City of Sarasota, the City of Northport, the City of Venice. Now mind you, this is 98, this is before the city um, drastically increased theirs and before a lot of the annex properties went into Northport. And the median range population for Sarasota County then would have been an additional 386,000 people. That was, in essence, the population of Sarasota County at the time. So I was making the argument that we needed to take a serious look at these designations. And I would suggest today that those are even more important because if you think it was difficult to get the transportation and the water and the utilities for the first 400,000 people, imagine how difficult and expensive it's going to be to accommodate the next 400,000. Now you've had changes in the state growth plan that actually require uh, that to be done um, at the uh, potential expense, not necessarily, but at, at the potential expense of the, of, of, of the, um, of the community. Sarasota County continued to make changes to the 2050 plan, um, minimizing some of the original promises that were, um, that were made at the time. So, I want to kind of wrap it up here, and I want to do a small discussion as an example on affordable housing. Because we have engaged in the state of Florida kind of an experiment in, in growth management since the early 1970s, so over, over the last 40 or, or so years. And it's too early to really tell how these new changes that took the, tw the first 20 or 30 years and then just totally upended them. It's really difficult to tell how those changes are going to impact our community, how they're going to impact our, our quality of life. But I would suggest that groups like Kona and others that are concerned with the long-range plans of the community. There has never, ever been a more important time for you to be engaged. Because if you think back since the 1970s, we've always had some level of state oversight, some level of regional oversight, some level of agency oversight. Well, we don't anymore. Um, and it's not likely to change dramatically any time in the near future. So the local governments still have all the tools at their disposal to do all the right things. That's not to say that they are going to do them, and in some cases there's clear examples where they have not. But the tools are there, and the only way to activate those tools is to have third parties, such as the people sitting in this room, becoming more and more active in the affairs of, of comprehensive planning. I want to close by giving you one example, and then I'll open it up um, for some, some questions. I recently, I've been engaged in affordable housing since I was a 19-year-old real estate broker working with veterans and families seeking FHA, <coughs> VA financing to buy homes. Um, 
So I took the time to review Sarasota County's comprehensive plan, and I pulled out every goals, objective, and policy within the comprehensive plan to see what exactly it is that we are doing. And to just give you an, an idea, um, this is still in the plan, by, mind you. Um, this is the affordable housing tagline. It says, the Sarasota County continues to grow. It acknowledges the need to provide a diversity of housing types and affordability levels to meet the needs of existing and future residents. This includes an available supply of housing that is affordable to residents in all income levels. And I love the way that's, that's worded. All income levels. So that means that we're going to have housing for people that are making $2 million a year, and we're going to have housing that's affordable to people making the minimum wage. I went back to the comprehensive plan and found probably about 30 policies that gave direction to the county on how we can accommodate the needs of affordable housing, including the goal of available housing supply that is affordable to residents in all income levels. And then I asked staff, I actually asked the Board of County Commissioners Chairman at the time, Mrs. Carolyn Mason, if they would allow me to engage staff and actually measure the efficacy of these policies, of these 30 policies. The answer to virtually all of the policies is that no housing has been created pursuant to this policy. No housing has been created pursuant to this policy over and over and over again. Now this was not a conscious effort of the county commissioners. This is not a dump on the county commission. I was actually on the board for a portion of, of this time period. But it's really an acknowledgement of the role that private citizens need to play. We have the tools, we have the policies in the comprehensive plan to protect our environment, to guard against development that's, that's not compatible with adjacent land uses. It's all there, but in today's um, environment where we no longer have the state oversight, we no longer have the regional oversight to help us, it's only going to be with the engagement of the community that we protect our environment, we protect our neighborhoods, we provide for affordable housing. So with that, um, I, I, I know that the, the presentation was kind of a historical um, retrospect of the state planning, but I hope that it paints for you a very clear and compelling picture of why you need to become engaged with comprehensive planning in Sarasota County now more than ever. So questions? If you have any questions, uh, you must wait for me to bring the microphone to you because your question needs to be recorded in our video, please. First question? I have one. Okay. Actually, I don't have a question, but I do want to amplify. <clears throat> You're not going to call me cuz, are you? No. <laughs> But it, as John went through to add up the numbers in the Sarasota Comprehensive Plan a few years ago, I don't know what the number is today, but if you took all the comprehensive plans in the state of Florida and added up their numbers, if they were built out, they added up to something like 99 million people in the state of Florida. And I'm sure you all know that we are now third after California, Texas, Florida. New York is now fourth in the population thing. And as John says, with fewer and fewer controls and regulations and oversight, it's the wild, wild east in terms of Sarasota County out here because between the census in 2010 and 2017, Sarasota County added 40,000 people. Manatee added 60,000. There's a question back there. <coughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat the question, Kathy. No, we need it on the table. Right. Got it. That's right. You said that. Okay. 
Um, my question is, you mentioned that time after time, report after report on the comprehensive plan, that all the commissioners had access to the information that nothing was being done for affordable housing. How you, as a former commissioner, can sit here and tell us that you were doing this great, tremendous study when nothing was being done and you yourself just stated it's continuous, that it's been ongoing for so many years. How do you foresee the current commissioners moving forward with anything different than what you've done? Well, let's, yeah, um, the way that I foresee it um, is that there is a heightened awareness of affordable housing in the community today. At one point, it was viewed as kind of a moral issue, like we need to take care of those that don't have the higher income levels and that it was the right thing to do. There were. Uh, Judeo-Christian values that would speak to it, but today um, I would point to the lack of a, I, my big pitch right now is for service workforce housing. Service workforce housing are those that are making at or near minimum wage. They are the individuals that uh, clean our swimming pools, that um, mow our lawns, they clean the doctor's offices, they are in the service and the hospitality industry. I would point to them as the um, the workforce that ensures the quality of life that every single one of us enjoy is maintained. In absence of having that, I believe that the lack of affordable housing, which has become increasingly more acute, this is, you know, 25, 30 years ago, um, this was nowhere near the problem that it is today, and I'll, I'll mention that in just a, a second. But now it's actually become a deterrent to economic development. All of the EBCs and the Chamber of Commerce have affordable housing listed as their number one priority. And that's new, that is different. So it is a completely different landscape. What I would also like to, um, to suggest, um, the reason um, that we're seeing the problem being so problematic today, um, when I was growing up, my father was the vice president of the largest development company in Sarasota County at the time, it was paper construction. And I can remember as a child developing visiting these developments that he was working on, Kensington Park, and others that other developers were working on, the Sarasota Springs, the Brentwood Estates, the Venetian Gardens, all over Sarasota County, entry-level workforce housing was under construction. We quit. We quit. And at the same time, the per capita demand for the service workforce shot through the roof. When I was a child, there was no landscape industry. There was one or two landscape businesses, but most of the landscaping and the pool work and most of this stuff was done by teenagers and by um, very small mom and pop organizations. Now it is a multi, multi, hundreds of million dollar industry. The per capita need that we demand now from our service workforce is at an all time high. <clears throat> So three things make the perfect storm, which makes affordable housing more acute today than it ever has been in the history of this community. Number one, we quit building the supply of affordable housing. Apartment complexes were almost a rarity to ever see go up. We stopped building the single family detached entry level workforce housing for like 25 years in this community. The per capita and the capita demand for the service workforce increased and over the last 18 years, the wages for this group of people has remained functionally stagnant. You cannot create a more perfect storm for the need for affordable housing as not only a quality of life, not only the morally the right thing to do, but also as an economic necessity for us to remain prosperous as a community. So that's how I would say it's different. Yes. Up, <laughs> um, hey John, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. <clears throat> with this concept of affordable housing, why has it been such, what is your perception of why it's been such a hiccup? I mean, you can look at median income for the county, <clears throat> it's pretty much stayed, it's, I think it's up to 52,000 now, but it's pretty much stayed 50, in, 54, I think it is. It's pretty much stayed in the high 40s for a long time. So if that's the income that we're looking at, I mean, it's not rocket science to do the math to be able to say, okay, a person who has this income, if they go to a bank to get a loan, a bank is only gonna give them this much money to buy a house. 
So we have that kind of you know, statistic to go by, and then at the same time, we have a development community that says they can't have affordable housing in their development because the numbers don't work, the banks won't give them the financing for that. So where in that you know, conflict between obviously data that's pretty concrete for us to look at and this language coming from the development community that says, well, we just can't do that. It doesn't make the numbers work. The banks won't loan us the money. Why is there that disconnect when the data supports a number? I mean, we can, you can pick a number of what somebody who makes $50,000 a year can qualify for a house, and those houses rarely exist. So if, if one was, I would recommend to everyone in the room that they take the time to visit the Schimberg Institute's website, which contains the best and the most accurate demographic data on a fine scale, a neighborhood scale, such as Bee Ridge or Osprey or Southgate or something like that, to look into some of this data. Um, first off, I'm not one that pokes a finger and blames developers. I, I, I've just not found that as being a constructive solution. The economics of what they are saying is true. I mean, think about this for a moment. Um, if you are going to engage in building, and first off, we are, Sarasota County will never get out of its affordable housing crisis unless we focus on apartment buildings. Sorry. It's just, I've looked at this every which way from Sunday, and that's where we need to begin because that is where the delta from income to housing costs is the greatest, and that's where the greatest need is. So you can inch away at all these other things, but you're never going to substantively address the problem unless you have rental apartment units. Um, mind you, they can be just spectacularly beautiful and very desirable, but that needs to be the focus. So let's say you're a developer. You have uh, 50 mm -hmm. acres of land, and you have these two development scenarios. One is this um, multifamily apartment complex, and the other are single-family detached, excuse me for saying, well, I won't say that. I, uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to be nice here. Um, the other are single-family detached gated community homes that are selling for four, dollars $500,000. Pretty standard, pretty typical for Sarasota County. Indeed, the cost for money to build the apartment is going to be more. You can get the money, but you're going to pay more for it. The permitting is going to cost you more, and it's going to take longer to get the permit. Because there will be people in single-family homes that are going to object to having multifamily homes in or around uh, their neighborhood. Secondly, the amount of, of getting the end user into the product, in other words, selling the home or getting a tenant into um, the product in order to have uh, near 100% occupancy, which is what you have to have in order to turn a profit because the, last, the profit in development is in the last 15% uh, percent of, of the units sold, is going to be more difficult and it's going to take additional time. 